Call the meeting of the Environment and Natural Resources Finance and Policy Committee to order. A quorum is present. Representative Heinzman, would you like to move the minutes for January 25th? So moved, Mr. Chair. Representative Heinzman moves the minutes for January 25th, 2023. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. Aye. Those opposed, no. Motion prevails. The minutes are adopted. First up uh, today, we have uh, three bills. The uh, first one is House File 749, Representative Norris, firefighting foam use prohibited and exemptions allowed. Representative Norris, welcome uh, to the committee. I will move that House File 742 be laid over. Uh, and Representative Norris, I believe you have an author's amendment. I will move the amendment. Representative Norris, could you explain it briefly? Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair and members of the committee. Great to be with you this afternoon. Uh, the A1 amendment uh, deals with a few unique firefighting situations where PFAS-free alternatives are still undergoing some additional development and testing before they're considered on par with PFAS foam. I've had some really productive conversations with stakeholders who are committed to ending the use of PFAS and firefighting foam as soon as practically possible. Uh, and we've agreed to this author's amendment to address some of those unique situations. Uh, it accounts for these situations by creating a carve out for oil refineries until the end of 2025. If there isn't a commercially available alternative uh, by then, those entities can apply to the state fire marshal for a waiver through January 1st, 2028. Uh, during that window, uh, the entities have also agreed to some additional obligations if they need to use PFOS containing firefighting foam to minimize the risk to individuals and the environment. Uh, I will acknowledge we're still having some conversations with Minnesota's airports and some other stakeholders, and I'm opening, open to considering additional tweaks uh, if necessary to the bill. I will move the A1 amendment to get the bill in the form the author would like. Mr. Chair. Representative Heinzman. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, appreciate in testimony just now hearing from the bill author that there are others that we are communicating with. Could I just confirm that, say, for example, refineries and a few others in that world are also part of that conversation? Representative Norris. Mr. Chair, Representative Heitzman, yes, uh, some refineries have already been part of these conversations, uh, and we're continuing to have conversations with other refineries as well. Representative Heinzman, the bill is being laid over so that communication can continue. Any further discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed say nay. Ayes have it. The A1 amendment is adopted. Representative Norris, to your bill as amended. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, this bill before us today, House File 742, is about protecting our heroes, Minnesota's firefighters. Later at today's hearing, you're going to hear the powerful testimony of Amara Strandy. She, like so many others, have suffered life-threatening conditions because of PFOS, also known as forever chemicals. We don't want any Minnesotan to suffer from exposure to these chemicals, but some of those most at risk are our firefighters. For years, PFOS have been used in firefighting foam. In 2019, Minnesota prohibited the use of firefighting foam that contained PFAS in training and testing situations. With the danger of these chemicals only becoming more apparent, the time has come to ban the use of this foam in all situations, which is what House File 742 does. Researchers have made excellent progress in developing PFAS-free alternatives for firefighting foam. And as a result, this bill would ban the use of PFOS foam in almost all circumstances in Minnesota. Now, federal law still requires the use of these foams in certain situations. So this bill contains a carve out for use when required by federal law. And I just covered the additional carve out that we included with the A1 author's amendment uh, to deal with some additional unique situations uh, where we're still working on, on making that transition to PFOS free foam. Uh, but I want to reiterate my commitment that given the devastating health and environmental impact of PFOS, we should not permit the use of these chemicals in firefighting foam a day longer than absolutely necessary to protect public safety. And so now I'd like to turn it over to our testifiers to talk more about the importance and the impact 
of this bill. Thank you, uh, Representative Norris. First up, we have Sean Kruzach, uh, the Duluth Fire Chief. Welcome to the committee. And state your name for the record. Uh, thank you. I'm Sean Kruzach, and I'm the City of Duluth Fire Chief. Good afternoon. My name is Sean Kruzach, and I'm the City of Duluth Fire Chief. Thank you for allowing me to testify today on the dangers of AFFF and PFAS firefighting foams and a larger body of chemicals referred to as fluorinated chemicals and their links to increased cancer in firefighters. PFAS, PFOA, and PFOS chemicals may be orally ingested, absorbed through the skin, or inhaled through exposure to the atmosphere. FEMA and the U.S. Fire Administration Protection Against Exposure Suggestions website advise that personnel at departments that use firefighting AFFFs with PFAS and other uh, fluorine chemicals should practice the following controls to stay safe from exposure. Replace older AFFF stocks of with fluorine-free foam solutions. Contain and manage AFFF and water runoff. Wear personal protective equipment, PPE, and self-contained breathing apparatus, SCBA, whenever handling AFFF foams. Properly remove and bag contaminated PPE prior to transporting. Use cleaning wipes on your face, neck, and hands immediately after exposure. Clean contaminated PPE and SCBA before the next use, and shower within one hour of returning to the station or home. These are some of the same measures we actually use when we respond to a hazardous materials incident. And we're having to do this after a, just an actual firefighting incident or some uh, emergency response that we go on. Um, I'm proud to say that the Duluth Fire Department has added these measures to our internal policies, but now we need your help to reduce continued exposure to other firefighters and the environment, including the pristine shores of Lake Superior. These are considered forever chemicals. They don't break down in the environment and we have contaminated land near the Duluth Airport and the 148th Fighter Wing that continues to threaten our groundwater and run off to Lake Superior. Unfortunately, I have attended several funerals this past year of retired Duluth firefighters. One common theme that I hear over and over again is that someone else has developed cancer or has re recently battled one of the higher risk forms of cancer associated, associated with PFAS foams. This is sad, but it's not a problem that is only affecting retired old firefighters. Today, we currently have a Duluth Fire Department captain who is battling prostate cancer, one of the specific types of cancer linked to AFFF and PFAS foam exposure. And we don't know if he'll be able to return to duty or possibly be looking at an even more tragic outcome. Ironically, another source of PFAS chemical exposure to firefighters is the personal protective equipment or PPE that we wear to protect ourselves while fighting a fire. Commonly known as turnout gear, this protective clothing uses PFAS chemicals in manufacturing parts of the moisture barrier and thermal liner. Recent studies have shown increases in blood serum levels of PFOA measured six hours post dermal exposure, demonstrating that the skin is likely a significant route of exposure. This proposed legislation is important as we work with our turnout gear manufacturers to replace legacy turnout gear manufacturing as new PFAS-free technologies become available. I've talked to several sales representatives who claim that there's still debate as to how dangerous PFAS absorption is as it relates to increased exposures and cancer risk. We're now being told to wear our turnout gear less often or for shorter periods of time to try to lessen our exposure to these dangerous toxins. Is that really an answer for firefighters? Wear dangerous gear for less amounts of time? We know, that, we know what we signed up for. We understand the risks we take to save lives, but being exposed to cancer-causing materials in the gear that is meant to protect us is a risk that we should not have to face. We are asking you to support this legislation restricting the use and manufacturing of these types of fluorinated, cancer-causing, and environmentally destructive chemicals. Thank you for your time, and I'll stand for any questions. We'll uh, hold uh, questions to the end of the testimony on House File 742. So if you could thank you. be around. Thank you. Uh, next up, uh, Scott Badness, Edina Firefighter, head of the Firefighters Association. Welcome to the committee. State your name for the record. Chair.
Chairman, Mr. Chairman, and members of the committee. My name is Scott Vadness. I'm president of the Minnesota Professional Firefighters. I represent over 2,000 firefighters, paramedics, EMTs, and dispatchers and from all areas of the state of Minnesota. I've been in the fire service for over 33 years. I'm a third generation firefighter and father of a fourth. I'm here today to speak in favor of House File uh, 742, introduced by Representative Norris. At the 2022 IFF Fallen Firefighter Memorial in Colorado, 75% of the names added to the wall were from occupational cancer. If asked, most Minnesotans would say the leading cause of death for firefighters is dying in a fire. They're not completely wrong. Fires do not kill us, but fighting fires and the chemicals associated with fighting fires do. Occupa occupational cancer is a leading cause of death in, fire, in the fire service as a whole. PFAS chemicals are in a huge number of materials that we use in our day-to-day -day basis. When I started in the fire service 33 years ago, we were told that our turnout gear would protect us and that firefighting foam would put out fires faster. We now know that both are a leading cause, or both are a leading cause of occupational cancer. We know firefighters have a 14% greater chance of dying from cancer than the public. Exposure to PFAS chemicals through firefighting foam has been related to an increase in bladder and testicular cancer. And there is a strong suggestion that an increase of other cancers like breast, prostate, bladder, and colorectal. There's also evidence of an increase in asthma and autoimmune diseases. The body of evidence is growing every day. Studies have shown that one application of AFFF has contaminated surface and groundwater. For example, one searcher said that a single five gallon container of firefighting foam will contaminate a, uh, enough water to fill 400 Olympic sized pools. AFFF is still the leading exposure to PFAS chemicals for our firefighters and is followed closely by our turnout gear. The IFF and the International Metro Chiefs Association recently came out with an advisory not to wear protective gear whenever possible. As a result, we have changed several areas in the fire service to better protect ourselves from PFAS chemicals. We are trying to change laws where applicable, like House File 742. We limit our exposure to PFAS chemicals during training by not using AFFF or other chemicals. We don't carry our dirty firefighting gear inside the, tr the cabs of the trucks after a fire. Instead, we do washdowns of firefighters and their gear at the scenes of a fire. We also require a shower before, before going back on the next call. The fire service is also changing how we build fire stations to help us protect us from PFASs. Simply put, I need your help protecting my son, my members from PFAS chemicals uh, so they can do the job that they love. I have never heard of a PFAS chemical that I want in my blood. They are man-made synthetic compound that are forever chemicals. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next, Ivana Stark, Clean Water Action. Chair Hansen and members of the committee, my name is Ivana Stark and I'm the State Director of Clean Water Action. We support House File 742 to protect first responders and to aid in source reduction of PFAS. When foam with PFAS is discharged, it seeps into underground and pollutes nearby water sources. From those sources, water enters our homes and our bodies. Bemidji, where many firefighting training exercises have been held, has a $20 million water treatment project because of PFAS in, the, in their wells. Estimates for cleanup in Minnesota range from between $250 and $1.2 billion. These costs don't address health care costs associated with falling ill from exposure. It's time to adopt these common sense solutions, especially as the EPA considers further reducing levels considered safe for exposure. It's vital that we clean up the current PFAS in the water while stopping the flow of new PFAS into the water, which requires more expensive cleanup. We must keep our water swimmable, fishable, and drinkable. That works starts today by stopping more harmful chemicals like PFAS from entering our Minnesota waterways. I urge your support of House File 742. Thank you. Thank you. Chad Larimer. <coughs> Welcome. State your name for the committee. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. My name is Chad Larimer. I'm a former United States Air Force firefighter. <coughs> Excuse me. 
In 1991, I was stationed at Chinoot Air Force Base, where we did fire training. It's one of the most polluted sites in America, with the groundwater testing at over 800,000 parts per trillion for PFAS. The EPA's recommendation in 2016 was 70 parts per trillion in your water. They're looking right now at moving that to 0 0.02 for, I believe that's PFOS and PFOA, 0 0.004. Right here at the Minneapolis airport, we're looking at nearly 700 parts per trillion. That may not seem like a lot, but as someone that hasn't used those chemicals in 30 years, they're still in my blood. I have laboratory tests that show elevated levels of PFOA, PFOS, and PFHXS in my blood today. I've had autoimmune diseases that magically caused type 1 diabetes. I mean, that was a really cool thing to get for my 40th birthday. I've survived cancer for no apparent reason other than the fact that I worked with these chemicals. We have to do more to protect the Minnesotans here from those dangers that have been seen in other states, other places. Our water is a pristine resource. Look at the things going on out west. We can't afford to pollute that with the PFOS, we can't afford to have this in our water, and I don't want to see another generation go through the things that I'm going through. Thank you. Thank you. Tony Quillis, Minnesota Chamber of Commerce. Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, my name is Tony Quillis, and I'm the Director of Environmental Policy at the Minnesota Chamber of Commerce. I want to thank you for the opportunity to take a couple of minutes today to talk about House File 742. I started working on this issue in 2019, Mr. Chairman, with yourself and Representative Becker Finn and some of the other stakeholders from uh, environmental groups and firefighter associations. And we came to an agreement on a law that prohibited the testing and training of firefighter foam that contained PFAS. So right now, Mr. Chairman, no one is using this foam at all for testing and training. It is only used for one reason and one reason only. There is an emergency situation that has existed. The current product is effective in putting out liquid fuel fires at airports and refineries and when water is used, it usually spreads the fires and sometimes accelerates the blaze. Right now, alternatives are being tested, but they're still not approved by the Department of Defense or the FAA. And there's not just one alternative being tested. There are numerous ones being tested and evaluated, and they're being used on various types of fuels and situations and scenarios. And so when you look at all of these situations and scenarios, they also have to be tested through different types of equipment and storage receptacles to make sure it works. So for example, different nozzles, different hoses. So there are alternatives out there and they're working on getting them. They're getting closer. Um, but tests are showing right now it takes twice as much foam and twice as much time needed to put out the simulations that they are being conducted for right now. And so, Mr. Chairman, once an alternative is certified, we need to make sure that there is a timeline in there for new equipment, training, and operating procedures for emergency personnel. We need to be certain that these alternatives work and are certified. And we need to be certain that the timelines are adequate and can be met. Because I said, this product is not being used. The only time it's being used is when there's an emergency situation and we need to ensure that our emergency responders have the ability to be able to go through and fight that emergency until a certified uh, alternative is approved and authorized. I wanna thank Representative Norris. Him and I have had a couple of meetings on this. I look forward to, I think there's some other stakeholder meetings that are gonna happen. I look forward to working with him and some of the other stakeholder groups to work through to make sure to ensure that we have these timelines uh, until we get that alternative. Mr. Chairman, I hope that alternative is here very soon, um, but we don't know that yet, but we're getting closer. Uh, and again, I'd like to thank Representative Norris for his open door policy and having conversations with me. And again, I look forward to working with the stakeholders to ensure the adequate timelines. Are there questions from members? 
Representative Jacob. Uh, thank you, Chair Hanson. So, I guess uh, kind of a twofold question. First of all, how often is this product being used? And then I think I've heard both that there are safe and effective alternatives, and I've heard that there's not uh, safe and alternative effect, um, effective alternatives. So, um, is, is do we have a safe replacement or not for this product? Representative Norris. <laughs> thank you, Mr. Chair, Representative Jacob. I think the the answer to that question depends on the circumstance. Um, in in most cases, we've got uh, a, a viable alternative. There are a few instances, for instance, uh, in use in refineries, where they're still doing some testing to make sure that these are uh, effective substitutes for PFOS containing foam. And so that's why you saw the author's amendment that we introduced today. It allows uh, for a window where there can be that additional testing uh, for the uh, refineries to transition over to these PFOS free foams and make sure that we can uh, make, protect our firefighters, protect the environment of Minnesota, uh, while also making sure that we're protecting public safety. So the first part of the question was, how often is a product being used? Representative Norris. Mr. Chair, Representative Jacob, uh, I'd rely on, on the folks who actually have that firefighting foam at their facilities right now to, to give you specifics. Uh, luckily, we don't often have instances like uh, refinery fires or airplane uh, fires here in the state of Minnesota. Uh, but. Uh, you know, I'll, I'll rely on them to give you the specifics of how often it's being deployed at their facilities. Would uh, Chief Krizach or uh, Mr. Badness want to answer that question? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, Representative. I, I don't have an exact number of how many times uh, PFAS chemicals are used in refinery fires. I can tell you that our partners in Superior, Wisconsin, I uh, actually talked to Chief Ulbrecht this week on this. Um, they use both. So they do have uh, AFFF or some type of fluorine-based uh, foam to fight the refinery fire there, uh, which was formerly known as Husky, now Sonovas uh, Refinery. Uh, they've got specific uh, fluorine hazards uh, as part of their manufacturing process there. Uh, in Duluth, we do not carry any uh, AFFF or uh, fluorine foam at all. When I started 25 years ago, all of our uh, fire engines had literally two foam tanks, one for what's called Class A combustibles, normal wood fire structure fires, and then uh, Class B foam, which we carried AFFF for fuel fires. Uh, the combination foam that we have today is sufficient to fight uh, normal smaller fuel fires uh, like a gas tank fire in a car, diesel uh, fire, that any kind of fuel oil fire that we see. But uh, at a large quantity uh, facility like a refinery, um, AFFF or some sort of fluorine-based foam is still the preferred method. Uh, I can't give you an exact answer on how often that's used in Minnesota, but we do not use it for training, as we talked about, and we do not use it for general firefighting. Representative Jacob. That's, that's all. Thank you. Uh, Representative Heinzman. Thank you, Chair. Representative Norris, I, I want to thank you for starting this conversation today. Uh, this one's near and dear to my heart. I can remember when uh, my dad was responding to fires throughout my childhood. I know that foam was used in some uh, instances, and uh, uh, there's so many hazards that, that folks in that world face. It's, it's really incredible that we can continue to find dedicated people willing to even consider entering this dangerous line of work. I do have a question. In testimony, Representative Norris, I heard that there's problems with gear. And I'm not sure if the bill addresses that or not, but I wanted to just kind of briefly touch on that and see if this is, if there's something here that gets to that, and if it isn't, kind of what your thoughts are going forward. 
Representative Norris. Yeah, Mr. Chair, Representative Heitzman, it, it's an important question. Uh, and we're still having conversations about whether this is the bill in which we're going to address the, the turnout gear or if we're going to have a, a separate bill related to that. But I do know that there's conversations being had amongst the stakeholders as well as um, you know the, the members of the committee to determine what the, the best avenue is to address that concern for our firefighters as well. Representative Heinzman. Thank you. Representative Norris, just to clarify so we understand kind of what the lay of the land is, are there alternatives? I haven't heard that in testimony or in other places. I could just have missed it. But are there, in terms of the gear, is there alternatives that departments could be securing different equipment? Representative Norris. Mr. Chair, Representative, uh, since my bill currently doesn't address the turnout gear, I haven't studied the turnout gear closely, so I wouldn't be able to answer that personally, but perhaps some of our other testifiers might have an answer to that. Would any of the testifiers like to respond to that? And the Pollution Control Agency is here and available for questions. Thank you. Representative, currently there is no manufacturer that has a PFAS-free turnout gear the problem is, is that uh, the standard in which we live under in the fire service is NFPA. In specific, 1971 has a clause in it that requires manufacturers to meet, that requires them to use the PFAS. So uh, on the international level, we are trying to change the NFPA 1971 requirement so that it, uh, we can exclude PFAS chemicals from our turnout gear. Um, just this week, uh, the NF. Uh, the IFF has doubled its uh, efforts to to do that, and in fact, yes, or just today, they announced three law firms that were going federally to get that uh, mandate uh, from the National Fire Protection Agency reversed. Representative Heinzman. Thank you. NFPA? Question mark. Yeah, the National Fire Protection <laughs> Association. So that is basically the industry standard in which we live by. It uh, it affects our fire trucks. It affects our training, our firefighting gear, um, just about every aspect of how we fight fires is uh, used as an industry standard. So when we're, when we're measured across the board, we are measured to the standards in which NFPA uh, has. Representative Heinzman. Thank you, Chair. I, I Sorry for the numerous questions, but to just continue to work on that issue, it sounds like it's very serious and maybe something that we need to continue to be talking about, gear specifically, but uh, you mentioned that it is a uh, the standard that you mentioned. Is that a law, or where is that found? No, it's just an industry standard, and it's a very well known in the fire service. So fire departments can request, not, or they don't have to follow NFPA, but when they're they're measured against the uh, you know laws and lawsuits and everything like that and best practices, the NFPA is the gold standard. Thank you, Mr. Chair. There's going to probably be more questions on that going forward. I'll take those offline. Representative Heinzman, we uh, are trying to figure out the best path and time of dealing with the turnout gear. If that's something in this committee or if that's a health committee, uh, I'd be happy to work with you and the author and interested parties as well. Thank you, Mr. Chair. As always, we would have liked to be a part of that. And then additionally, it's obviously something that has to be uh, explored in terms of what are the options and it sounds like those things are being worked towards but uh, technology seems to be lagging. Representative Edison. Thank you Mr. Chair and I'm wondering if um, the Mr. Qualis from the Minnesota Chamber could come back up to the table and, and I want to also thank um, Scott Vandas who is an Edina firefighter and one of the best I will say. <laughs> Mr. Qualis. Uh, Mr. Quillis, um, you said that refineries and airports don't have the capability of putting out, there's not an alternative to the Class B foam, is that correct? Currently, there is not an alternative, no. And the bill itself, if you look at uh, in House File 742, Representative Norris has mentioned also with that Code of Federal Relations, Code of Federal Regulations, Title 14, Section 139, specifically references airports. Mm -hmm. And so that's why it says required by federal law. That specifically required airports. And then the A1 amendment um, that, represent, that the committee has adopted then transferred back to refineries and terminals. terminals. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Mr. Qualis, um, I, I appreciate the A1 amendment and the, uh, the ability to have this um, temporary ex exemption. Um, and I get that we have a problem. There's no temporary exemption for our firefighters who are getting cancer, though. There's no rewind. So tell me what airports and refineries are doing to address this. Are they investing heavily and looking at alternative ways? How are they actually helping to make sure that we're finding something that's not going to give our firefighters who save our communities cancer? Mr. Mr. Chairman, Representative Edelson, I can't comment on what individual airports and refineries are doing. I'm sure they are working with and part of this survey uh, alternative testing that they're going through. I can't comment. I don't know specifically along those lines and what they're doing. They're following federal law right now that says they cannot use, they have to wait until it gets approved by the Department of Defense and the Federal Aviation Airline, FAA. So until those rules are changed and these folks are close to being there, but right now the alternatives have not been there. And so Again, this is not being used. This product is not being used. It's something that Representative Hansen, Representative Heinzman, myself, and Representative Becker Finn worked on, along with the stakeholders from the environmental groups and along with the firefighters union to go through to prohibit the testing and training. But right now, this product is not being used unless there's an emergency situation. <laughs> Just one more. I thought you apologize. I think there's actually some other testifiers that may be able to answer that question. That would be great. I would just hope that you're testifying, you're, you're speaking with the FAA as much as, as, as uh, we are here trying to get exceptions. Mr. Close. Mr. Chairman, Representative Edelson, I've had some brief conversations with my friends at the Airports Association, and we continue as we have the stakeholder conversations with Representative Norris and other folks that are involved. I'm sure we'll all be working with the FAA and the Department of Defense to see where they're at in the process. To the question, Representative Edelson, I see that the Airports Commission is here. Would they want to testify? Mr. Killian, <laughs> come forward. State your name for the record. And the Chairman Hansen, um, Re Representative Norris, and, and committee members, Mitch Killian, Metropolitan Airports Commission. I'm the Vice President of Governmental Affairs there. Tough act to follow today for us. <laughs> But I want you to know first thing up front that we all want to get rid of the stuff. With me today is our fire chief uh, in the crowd with me as well. And Tom uh, Warner, the Duluth Airport manager, is here as well. We at the D.C. level have been working hard to get rid of the stuff. If, over my career, if I went back four or five years, the lead advocates for getting the federal government to focus on changing the standard were airports. The American Association of Airport Executives and Airports Council International advocated to get the FAA to change the criteria. And then it's not the FAA that sets the criteria, it really is the Department of Defense. So the Department of Defense has been working at it for years to try to come up with this new criteria. And it's a highly scientific matter. It's not like a whole bunch of us guys that just run the airports are the ones that are gonna go out and study it. We don't even have scientists on our staff. So that's where it lands in the Department of Defense. They are really close to coming up with a new uh, mill spec. That's what it is. it's a military spec that defines the stuff. And when they come up with that new mill spec, then they're going to change the criteria. Right now, we've been required to use it for a long time by the federal government, and we're still required right now to use it. And when the new mill spec comes out, right now the closest that they're telling us from the FAA is that an advisory circular is gonna come out late this year to advise us, but it's regulatory in nature, and we're gonna get new advice on what we need to do in the future. But this isn't just Metropolitan Airports Commission here. Just to know that this is Three River Falls, International Falls, Bermidji, Brainerd, Rochester are all using this stuff right now because the federal government is requiring us to. We are working to transition from it and we want to continue to. The issues that have been raised here regarding, I don't wanna like downplay our hopes of moving on from it at all, but there is a real transition problem and when we don't even know what the new product is, how will we flush our old products? There's really a lot of talk about the military hangars may have to take down the pipes that have the fire suppression system in them and melt them down. I'm no expert on this, but that's what I've heard. Chairman Hansen, I see you nodding. 
that they may have to melt down all their pipes to get rid of it because if you just flush them, you're gonna contaminate the new product that's gonna come in. The new product that's gonna come in, actually very likely, I, I, actually I, I'm no expert on it, but could have an amount of PFAS in it. As you know, today groundwater has PFAS in it, so what is the new requirement that we're gonna have before us? So all of us airports are sitting back going, we're trying to plan for this transition, we don't know the product, we don't know the cleaning systems that we're gonna need in place, but we are working at it. The local air service action committee in Minnesota is made up of the air carrier airports, we're working at it. Our fire chief that's with me today is working hard at it. And we wanna be leaders in transitioning out of this stuff, but we need to make sure we have a logical process to get out of it. So uh, I really, uh, we, we wanna get rid of the stuff. Representative Edelson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'm glad to hear you're working on it. And, and, um, and how long have you known, how, how long have we known about it? And when you knew about it, did we go and seek uh, you know, help from the Department of Defense right away? I mean, I guess you, we're hearing about these health concerns. And I know that we want exceptions. We want to keep communities safe. I've been to Flint Hills. I understand the, the dangers and there's communities there. Um, I just, you know, this is a community problem. I would hope that we are pushing uh, really hard because if we look, we have firefighters here. This is no joke. This is serious. People will not get to go home at night and see their kids grow up. So thank you. Mr. Killian. Uh, Representative Fisher. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, thanks, Rep. Norris, for bringing this forward. Uh, I appreciate the work you're doing on it. I want to make sure that as you're going forward, as, as there gets to be any further discussions, that whatever the firefighters want, we follow on that. Uh, they're the ones that are going to be in the dangerous situation in the future. If they've got to decide which they want to do is use that foam or go in without using the foam or using an alternative product, I think we defer to them. They've got to make a tough choice go in that direction. But I think what part of the problem comes in is that I remember years ago in this committee hearing about the process that's used on chemicals and testing what is hazardous and what isn't. And so many of the chemicals we have have never really been tested for what the long-term effects on people are. This is a perfect example of one of those chemicals that is not just impacting firefighters, but in the, North, in the East Metro, we've got situations where the groundwater is contaminated. I'm sure we're gonna hear about uh, people who've had, and I've been hearing in the news, uh, children who were drinking it that was in the water who now have cancer or who are dying from it. And these are the consequences that we've been so, so fast in developing chemicals and not taking the time to do the research to see what the long-term effects are. And I think that's one of the things if we have capacity is for, for the committee to get that understanding again is how many of these chemicals are not tested and how many are because it's when I heard it years ago, it was shocking how many are looked at the long-term effects. And we may have other situations like this that are gonna come up, but it may be 10 or 15 years before we see it and by then it's too late. I think something the committee may want to look at and consider is what do we do if we have this budget surplus? Um, how do we look at, is there a need where we can provide assistance with data or biomonitoring or research or something that we can do to provide information to help speed up the evaluation and knowing that the federal government may move slow. Um, but if there's something we can do, you know, not just for the folks that are in this room, but the folks that are throughout the state that are dealing with this. If we can do something to help with that data collection, data management, biomonitoring, we've, we've looked at that before. So um, I think that's something for us to consider. We have three bills today, um, and I have two, three more people on the list uh, on this bill. I want to take those questions, and then we'll wrap up. This one is being held over, and there's a reason for that. Uh, so. Hopefully we can think about that, and for the folks that are here, what can we do on this to help this? So I'm gonna to go to Representative Heinzman, then Representative Lee, and then Representative Lisligard. <coughs> Representative Heinzman. Thank you, Chair, and I think I can handle this one from here, and to the gentleman that testified a moment ago from the airports, is there a number? It'd be nice to get a ballpark idea of in the last year 2022, how often this foam was used at airports? If you could tell us one, two from the audience, Mr. or if you need to testify, Mr. Kelly, I understand. I think you might have to come up forward. Just to... 
My apologies, Mr. Chair. I was trying to simplify and get this question. <laughs> Uh, Mitch Killian again, Metropolitan Airports Commission. I don't know about all the airports in the state, but I knew, know specifically about ours. In the last three years, because we, we care, we really are looking at this hard, and we know every piece that comes on our airfield and where it's going. Uh, 80, 80 gallons was used, it, in the last three years, we used it twice. 80 gallons was used in a pavement fire, which is considered a petroleum fire. 80 gallons was used. And another one, a catering truck was burning underneath the terminal, partway underneath the terminal, and we used 20 gallons. So a total of 100 gallons over three years was spread at, at, throughout the MAC system. Yeah, thank you, Chair. I, I think the takeaway for all of us here today is that we're all passionate about this issue. And I really appreciate your testimony today, Mr. Uh, Mr. Killian. Thank you so much for sharing with us and giving us a better idea of what's going on. Both sides of the table care about this issue. And, Glad to uh, be working towards solutions. Thank you. Chairman Hansen, I, yeah. I, I missed one piece oh, yeah. in my opening comments that last year in the appropriations bill that p passed in D.C. between December and January, you know, the big appropriations mm -hmm. bill that had everything in it, airport trade associations, again, were the ones lobbying. There wasn't other groups lobbying for the transition plan from the federal government. And the FAA right now has on their plate a required transition plan to try to help us after they've been requiring us to use it for so long to figure out some transition plan, and that was passed in the appropriations bill. Representative Lee and then Representative Litzgar. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And uh, I don't know who will be best to answer this question, whether it's uh, the MPCA or the Clean Water Action. So uh, we heard around the water quality issue from the Bem city of Bemidji because of the airport. And Mr. Chair, I just wanted to know, do we know of the other airports that have used the foams in the past? Are they, those local municipalities, experiencing uh, any types of water quality issue too? Mr. Johnson with the Pollution Control Agency. Committee. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members. Um, for the record, Tom Johnson, uh, Government Relations Director for the Minnesota Pollution Control Agency. And Representative Lee, to your question, uh, I believe we, for the other airports, um, there's currently monitoring that uh, we're conducting as part of the uh, uh, PFAS monitoring plan that the agency uh, released. Uh, I believe that was the end of fall of last year. Um, but we have not specifically seen drinking water concerns so far. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and, you know, thank you for that, Mr. Johnson. I think I just want to raise it up because this is a concern for us, you know, back in uh, 2020 at the state of Minnesota, you know, in helping out the city of Bemidji uh, provided uh, $10 million in, you know, bonding proceeds to go towards the water treatment, and in addition to that, uh, 3M with a settlement with the city it provided $12.5 million for their uh, water treatment facilities out there. And so I think that this is going to be a huge cost for the public and for the entire state of Minnesota as we see a lot of these uh, infrastructure, water infrastructure requ requests coming before us uh, at the state. And so really uh, appreciative of uh, Representative Norris bringing this uh, bill forward for us to have this important discussion. Thank you. Representative Thank you, Mr. Chair, and it's just kind of a comment and then a question for the MPCA uh, before you leave. Um, you know, listening to the Department of Defense, we're waiting for them to make a decision. Uh, we went from no cars to cars to Mars in the last 120 years, and you would think that if uh, we have the technology and if we have the will, we'd find a way especially when people's lives are, are at stake. So that one really bothered me. It's not your fault, um, sir, because it's, not, it's, it's the Department of Defense or it's the federal government. Um, but I want to get to your, your broader question, what are we going to do, right? So in the last four years since I've been here, this is a very, um, very, very bad chemical that we need to address. And so I want to know what we're doing with all the byproducts. Where is it going? Is it going into the uh, wastewater treatment um, processes? Do we have um, facilities that are lined that could take this to keep it out of the atmosphere? What are we doing as a state to prepare to capture this very dangerous uh, chemical that is, uh, that's impacting people's lives? 
Mr. Johnson. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me. Thank you, Mr. Chair and uh, Representative Lizgard. I, uh, I think to just specifically to um, address the Department of De Defense. I know that there uh, is a draft mill spec at least. I'm, I'm not exactly sure if that's been finalized yet, but I believe they're on the way to finalizing a specification for fluorine free foam. So I, I do believe that where there's a will, there's a way to your point. Um, the, what we're doing about it is a, is a little bit more complicated question. I think uh, we have the PFAS blueprint that uh, the MPCA and many of our sister agencies put together um, to address that very question. And you know, there, there's three major pieces of that, prevention, uh, management, and cleaning up. Uh, to the cleanup piece and the management piece, um, we're still getting our arms around that, to be frank. It's a complicated situation, as we know, and uh, the first piece of that has been the PFAS monitoring plan. And so we're, we're really looking to get a comprehensive picture of where PFAS is in the state before we're able to take um, uh, uh, specific actions to address those, uh, whether it be at wastewater facilities, as you mentioned, uh, certainly uh, a good amount of PFAS is coming into wastewater treatment plants and then and then out the back end if they don't have a specific form of treatment like uh, granulated activated carbon which are other technologies that are expensive um, or whether it goes to to landfills in our waste uh, stream um, or other facilities compost facilities those are also having challenges to to manage PFAS as well so it, it's a uh, it's definitely a, a concern of the agency and of the, the, the state as a whole, and uh, we, have a, we have a plan in the PFAS blueprint, and certainly um, bills like this that prevent uh, PFAS from entering our system are, are much needed. So thank you for Representative Thank you, Mr. Chair, for the indulgement. So I do appreciate that, but I mean, just like the Department of Defense, you know, they've been working on it for a long time. I'm going to bring a bill forward. And it is going to be a wonderful um, bill that's going to be for Northeast Minnesota. And it's going to be a lined facility that's going to be able to take all this PFAS, right, for the next 50 years. So we're starting to be proactive. I don't want to study it to death, man. I've been watching permits and everything be study, study, study. Sometimes you just got to move. So I'm going to bring a bill forward, and I hope you would support it. Representative Norris, close. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, in closing, I just want to reiterate that there there is some important balancing we need to do here in terms of understanding the public safety aspect of this. But uh, the fact remains that these chemicals are threatening the lives of our heroes, our firefighters, as well as everyday Minnesotans. Uh, and so I'll reiterate, reiterate my pledge uh, that we can't allow these to continue to be used a day longer than absolutely necessary. Uh, and I look forward to uh, continuing those conversations with the stakeholders, and I'm sure I'll uh, be back before too long before the committee. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I should ask, is there anyone in the audience who would like to testify for or against this bill? I renew my motion that House File 742 as amended be laid over. The bill is laid over. Next up, House File 552, uh, Representative Katiza Watoon. PFAS and juvenile products prohibited. <laughs> Welcome, Representative Tisa Watoon. I will move that House File 552 be recommended to be re referred to the Committee on Commerce, Finance, and Policy Committee. Yeah. Representative Katiza Watoon, to your bill. Thank you, Mr. Chair and committee members. Uh, it's great to be here in environment, in person. Um, I know we had a great conversation on this bill last session, and um, I'm pleased to, to bring it back to be before the committee, um, and I'm encouraged that we can get some good work done together this year. Um, I, I'll just give kind of a brief overview. Um, House File 552 is a ban on the usage of PFAS in juvenile products. Uh, the language is pretty clear, but you know, basically this, this is um, a product that is designed or marketed for use by children under the age of 12. And with, you know, with some of the concerning information that and research that has been done and come out and saying that um, PFAS has now been found in breast milk. Um, and and it's, it's really, there's a lot, um, a number of bodily challenges that this can cause. And just knowing as a, as a mother that, you know, 
we, we don't know what we don't know. And so when we buy a product, we, when um, someone gives a gift to our child, we have the expectation that hopefully it's safe. And so, I mean, for, you know, we've been, we've been unknowingly um, keeping some of these products in our home. And I think that when we know better, we can do better. And I'm, I am appreciative of the committee's consideration. I'm looking forward to the conversation today, and um, I'm just I'm going to turn it over to the testifiers. Uh, we have several testifiers. First up, Amara Strand. Welcome to the committee. Hello, uh, Mr. Chair and members. Um, my name is Amara Strandy. I am uh, 20 years old, and um, when I was 15, I was diagnosed with fibrolamellar hepatocellular carcinoma. This is a rare form of liver cancer, and it has no form of treatment or cure. I am here today like anyone else, it is not uncommon for me to ponder what may have caused my cancer. I look back today and I wonder what sort of toys I used in my youth that contained PFAS. The toys that would ultimately assist in creating my condition. When toxins in the environment hit a person's DNA at a particular vulnerability, a cell mutates resulting in cancer or other serious illnesses. Similar, similarly, one of my cells mutated and cancer began to grow. Growing up, not only was I a victim of PFABs, but I also lived in a 3M plume and attended Tartan Senior High School, where I met many classmates affected, directly affected by PFABs. Some result from family members and friends developing cancer, and some developing cancer themselves. We now understand these chemicals to be PFABs. Unfortunately, people being subjected to dangerous chemicals unknowingly happen far too often. It's a repeated offense that has festered our land, water, and bodies for decades. I care about this issue because it has personally changed the direction of my life and the lives of everyone around me. PFAVs robbed my sister and I of a normal childhood in our teenage years. Banning PFAVs in juvenile products is just the beginning of addressing the toxic waste that plagues our communities. I insist you stand against these toxic chemicals and demand change. Together we can make a difference and protect ourselves and future generations from the devastating effects of PFAVs. Corporations must stop the production of these, of these toxins and be held accountable when it comes to protecting our youth. I never want to see another child undergo the horrors of childhood cancer again. Protecting our children from PFAVs is just a start and address and addresses the bare minimum of a much larger issue at hand. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Michael Strandy. Chair Hansen and members of the committee, my name is Michael Strandy and I am the father of Amara Strandy. I'd, I would like to start out by just acknowledging um, the passing of uh, Senator Durenberger this morning. And uh, he was a great champion for health care, health reform in our medical system, which I've had to face very intimately over the last five years. And it's greatly needed. But that's another issue for another time. After Amara was diagnosed with fibrolamellar carcinoma, my wife and I did what any parent would do. We wanted to know what caused this insidious disease that was attacking our 15-year-old daughter. 
we got in touch with Dr. Sandy Simon, a leading researcher in fibrolamellar carcinoma at Rockefeller University. He discovered that the cause of this type of cancer was a breakdown in a person's DNA that comes about from cells in the body mutating, then replicating until it does damage to the DNA on a molecular level. We wanted to know if there was anything that Amara was in contact with that may have caused the breakdown of her DNA. What we know about the PFAS chemicals is that they can and do attack human cells, causing them to mutate and then replicate. We wanted to know what products in the markets contained PFAS. What we discovered is PFAS was found in products such as cleaning products, water-resistant fabrics, such as rain jackets, umbrellas, and tents, grease-resistant paper, nonstick cookware, personal care products, shampoos, dental floss, nail polish, and eye makeup, stain-resistant coatings used in carpets, upholsteries, and other fabrics. And some of the most surprising products where these chemicals can be found, Halloween costumes and children's toys. When did my wife and I discover how pervasive PFASs are? Only recently in the past few years. Knowing what I know about how deadly these forever chemicals can be, I would have been more diligent as to what I was bringing into my home and certainly would have been more cautious about what toys I would have allowed my daughters to play with. In my naivete, I made the assumption that manufacturers would never intentionally use or not be allowed to use such harmful chemicals that could have a horrifying effect on my family. In navigating what is harmful and what is not, it would have been extremely helpful to have known that at least the government was doing all it could do to ensure that toys were safe for my daughters to play with because they did not contain deadly PFAS chemicals. I urge you to support House File 552. Thank you. Thank you. Andrea Lovell, Minnesota Center for Environmental Advocacy. Thank you, Chair Hansen. My name is Andrea Lovell. I am the Legislative Director at Minnesota Center for Environmental Advocacy. Minnesota Center for Environmental Advocacy is a nonprofit organization with almost 50 years of experience using law and science to protect Minnesota's environment. MCEA supports this bill. It takes measured yet significant steps towards addressing the public and environmental health crisis. As you've heard today, PFAS, perfluoral alkyl substances, is an umbrella term for a class of chemicals. They are forever chemicals that do not degrade over time and are difficult and expensive to clean up. Moreover, they are water soluble and they bioaccumulate, meaning they builds up in your body over time. It doesn't get flushed out. They also transfer from mother to child and through breast milk. These chemicals are poisoning our drinking water, making our fish unsuitable for human consumption, and costing taxpayers millions of dollars in cleanup and associated costs. Minnesota consumers are likely unaware that the products that they're buying for their children contain synthetic chemicals associated with the battery of health, uh, adverse health outcomes. I am a mom of a beautiful two-year-old daughter. It deeply concerns me that my daughter could be exposed to PFAS chemicals in the products that I buy to care for her, and I may not even be aware of it. Working in an environmental organization and also being a parent makes me very hyper aware of these situations, and it literally keeps me up at night. No Minnesota parent should have to worry that their children's pajamas, crib mattress, mattress, or toys will one day cause them to have cancer. That is a failure of regulation, not of ours as parents. These bills directly advance public health by reducing pathways of direct exposure for Minnesotans. The MPCA's PFAS blueprint begins monitoring of the problem. 
but watching the flood rise in the boat doesn't stop it sinking. First, you need to stop her the whole. Without stopping the use of PFAS, cleanup is not the way out of the problem. The PCA stated in its PFAS blueprint, the pollution must be prevented from the outset through restrictions or bans on PFAS uses. That is precisely what this bill does. In closing, I would like to remind everyone in this room that we can thrive without PFAS chemicals in our everyday products. PFAS are manufactured chemicals that were never truly necessary. These bills aim to restore common sense by eliminating chemicals from products Minnesota's use in every day. I urge everyone to heed the calls from our state scientists demanding legislative help in combating these insidious chemicals from moving this bill forward. Thank you. Havana Stark, Clean Water Action State Director. Chair Hansen and members of the committee, I'm Ivana Stark, the State Director of Clean Water Action. PFAS chemicals are a threat to pregnant women and children. When PFAS is in the mother's body, it enters the fetus through the mother's cord blood. PFAS has also been found in 100% of breast milk samples tested. Studies have found links between PFAS exposure in cord blood and changes in vital body molecules called cord blood lipids, as well as harm to the fetal and childhood development. PFAS exposure in children has been linked to behavior problems, lower IQ, learning disabilities, a reduced immune system response, low birth rate, childhood obesity, and type 2 diabetes, and of course, an increased risk in childhood cancer. These health impacts create long-term financial and emotional costs for the toy long after the toy is discarded. These are some toys I took out of my son's box. He was not super happy about watching Elmo walk out the door. Um, but these are toys that he routinely plays with, puts in his mouth, brings in the bathtub, chews on, touches, then puts his hands in his mouth. We owe it to our children to keep these dangerous chemicals out of their hands. Toys that are um, manufactured and distributed typically from China, the cheaper the toy is, the more likely these toys are to have PFAS. So I urge you to support House File 552 so um, that we can protect our children. Thank you. Thank you. Right, Tony Quillis, Minnesota Chamber of Commerce. Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, for the record again, my name is Tony Quillis. I'm the Director of Environmental Policy at the Minnesota Chamber of Commerce. Just a couple of brief comments, Mr. Chairman, on House File 552. Previously, when we've regulated uh, products here in Minnesota, this one's under Minnesota Section 116 statutes, uh, Section 116. But on, uh, previously under 325F is where we normally do that. I'll give you a couple examples of BPA, formaldehyde, most recently was food packaging. A couple of the um, language that is including there to make it parallel to this that's unfortunately not in this one right now, but I'd like to thank Representative um, Katiz Watoon for having conversation with me a couple of times, unfortunately due to crazy schedules. It's usually been um, as we've been walking by each other. And this is also what I testified to last year, Mr. Chairman, is in those bills, uh, BPA, formaldehyde and food packaging, intentionally added definition has been included in those. And as you'll see throughout most of these PFAS bills that we've talked about over the last couple of years, also intentionally added is included in the definition. And then also, Mr. Chairman, uh, on the last page on the effective date where it talks about January 1st, 2025, I always like to point out for my friends in the uh, retail uh, industry, we always include a, a manufacturer retail lag. You can never do just a stop of a manufacturer. This would allow a stop for the manufacturer and then a sale through to get rid of the product that's in the chain of commerce. And we've done that again also for BPA and formaldehyde and food packaging. Then the last two points, Mr. Chairman, just to make them, at least in my research, a couple other states that have done this, Colorado and California, to be consistent with them, 
I testified last year, uh, de minimis of 100 parts per million is what we had talked about. And then also, um, we talk about what, um, what juvenile product is not within there to get some clarification around what direct contact is there. Uh, and I can't, I'm gonna mix up my C's. It's either Colorado or California. Mr. Chairman, um, further clarify the direct contact there for what is not um, a product there affected. So Mr. Chairman, thank you for the time. I appreciate you uh, and appreciate um, Katiza Batoon, Representative Katiza Batoon working with me on this. I think the next stop is commerce. And so her and I will hopefully have not hallway conversations, um, but her and I will keep having conversations um, about this as we move forward. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Representative Edelson. Oh, you, sh you should definitely stay up there. <laughs> <laughs> All right, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, well, first of all, I guess I, I would like the MPCA to say if there's any amount of PFAS that is safe. And then before we go to that, you, we, I just want to talk to you. You said um, the clause that you wanted to have added, um, intentionally added, is that to make sure that uh, members, if they were having a product, your chamber members, if they had a product that was in something else that they were making, they didn't know that's what would cover them? Is that what you're saying, Mr. Um, Qualis? There would be, let's see, how's the best way to describe this? Really? Uh, Mr. Chairman, Representative Edelson, there is um, an end product. PFAS is not intentionally added into that product, but as it's moving through a conveyor belt or as being assembled, there is a chance that it touches that product. It's not intentionally added to the product. And we've done that through like I said, in, in the PFAS bills that we've talked about the last couple of years, intentionally added is the key there. Mr. Chair, um, Mr. Quellis, um, you had said a sell-through, so that you would have a sell-through. And I just want you to know that I would be very opposed to that. I'm just going to tell you that right now. So if that language comes, I will find it and make sure that we try to stop it. So I just want to be very clear on this. Maybe if it's something that we have to work on, um, that we as a state could buy those products and figure out how to dispose of them, maybe there's a different solution. But a sell-through of making sure that Minnesotans have products that are going to make them sick in their homes is not a good idea. So thank you, Mr. Chair. Representative Fisher. Thank you. Representative Finke. Thank you, Chair Hansen, and to the testifier. Um, Representative Edelson made my point. We are stopping the production of dangerous chemicals. We should not ensure that we sell through all of the dangerous chemicals. Representative Heinzman. Thank you, Chair. And, uh, you know, thank you for your, uh, your, your bill, Representative. Uh, I'm glad that we are hearing testimony from everybody today, Mr. Chair, because this is, this is a, this is a bill that has broad reaching effect. And it's something that really does need to be thoroughly discussed. And even if there are certain uh, words that are concerning to us, we need to fully understand the impact. And you know, it's, uh, it's a conversation that started a while ago and I've obviously interjected uh, in, in its discussion, referencing products that I personally make. And I know that while the intentions of this committee are very good, we have to be very deliberate in how we approach this problem and make sure uh, that we are uh, being careful in how we accomplish our end goal, which is mutually shared. Mm -hmm. um, and I appreciate that we're not the first ones to discuss this. There are a number of other states that have gone through this process and that are uh, sharing the concerns that have been expressed here today, California being one of them. And I believe that it would make sense, and I hope that the bill author is open to working with others in, the, in, the, in, the, in, in this subject area to try and, and make sure that we're getting at those shared goals. Because they're, they're, whereas we're hearing in testimony today, there's, there's concerns. And I have uh, shared concerns on both sides of this. So uh, I would hope to hear that commitment today. I'd like to see something happen nationally, and I brought that up the last time this bill came forward. I'd like to see the federal government 
And I would have thought that in the last few years that that was going to happen. Quite honestly, that was an expectation on a personal level, and it didn't. And maybe there's others that know why. I don't. I can't speculate. But uh, that leaves us, well, what is working? And it appears that, that California has addressed this, and I hope that we can come close to working on this intentionally added issue and making sure that there's some uniformity as, as states are moving forward with their plan to try to protect children, to protect families, protect moms and dads. Representative Cortez, over to Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Representative Heinzman, um, for, for sharing your thoughts. Um, I know, I mean, I think that we had a, I, I appreciate you sharing your experience kind of in, in manufacturing uh, on, on a small scale. And um, and certainly as a, a small business owner, I know that it's not your intention, being a father, um, to, to, to be exposing anyone's child to, um, unintentionally to, to PFAS. So I, I'm one of the things that I think throughout the, the retail chain we do need to make sure of, and I think that you know, we, can, we can definitely discuss the, the wording that uh, Mr. Quellis has um, brought to my attention as some other states have done. But I think we wanna just make sure that wherever in the chain we can make the most impact um, is where we wanna do that. So um, I, I think I, I would welcome further um, collaboration. Are there any questions from members? Mr. Chair. Representative Heinzman. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I would just comment, at that I certainly appreciate that, Representative. That's really what we need, I think, is, is that collaborative effort to make sure we get at the heart of this issue together. I think we're better on this, and uh, I'm thankful for that commitment. Any other questions from members? Mr. Quillis, uh, you know, last time we had this in front of us, I think I asked you, is there any naturally occurring PFAS, PFAS, or fluoral alkaline? Is there any? Is this a naturally occurring compound? Mr. Chairman, I think we weren't in this, and I forgot about my homework that you gave it to me. But I do not think, and PFOA and PFOS are naturally occurring. Now I could be corrected on that, but that's just off the top of my head. We create. Um, is there anyone in the audience who would want to testify? Mr. Diamond, I see, is coming forward. Thank you, Chair. Tom Diamond, St. Paul. Um, I didn't know which one of these bills to uh, speak on. Uh, both, all three of them are uh, important bills to deal with uh, PFOS. And uh, just to uh, uh, speak a little bit about how important this dealing with the, the issue of PFOS is and how big a problem it is, um, I'd like to speak about uh, uh, in St. Paul, we have uh, 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 two Superfund sites that uh, part of the reason why those are Superfund sites is because of PFAS in, uh, uh, in it and that the manufacturer of the product uh, 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 dumped it there. The, to the credit of the legislature, $800,000 was provided to do a study last year to start the study to remove this material, clean this uh, 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 up. But just to show you the craziness, if you think you got this PFAS under control, let me tell you. So right next to this, in a national park, a state critical area, a regional park, there is being dumped 80 million gallons of PFAS pollutant into our aquifer. 80 million gallons of it into our aquifer. Um, uh, we have, uh, uh, in our part of uh, St. Paul, we actually have uh, wells. Uh, to the credit of the MPCA, they do uh, test the wells, and they're polluted. They're contaminated by uh, uh, PFOS, uh, P PFOA, et cetera. Uh, and as a matter of fact, five different uh, uh, compounds are found in our particular well. 
uh, to their credit also, they will be providing uh, us with uh, 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 whole house uh, water filters uh, for 30 years. Catch is, there is so much demand for this, they can't get them installed. So we don't have it. We drink uh, bottled water, that's what we have to go by, use and stuff. But even if that gets done, um, if you think about, so the pollution that's in here not only affects uh, because it bioaccumulates. You know, if you say, okay, you got this fraction, whatever it is, in the water that you're in, but you keep drinking water and it keeps building up and building up and building up. Also, if you've got a garden and you're growing vegetables or whatever you want to do, you water that and the PFOS is going into the ground and polluting your soil permanently. The other thing that it does is when you jump, I was saying this 80 million gallons of this mix uh, into the aquifer, they're dumping it directly into the aquifer. The way the compound works, it travels very easily through the uh, soils and into it. So it's just like putting this product on there and it directly going in down into the aquifers, poisoning everybody, not just us. It's a it's a amazing uh, thing. So we uh, the residents, uh, some of the uh, people in the city and stuff, uh, wanted to do something about this, and we committed to cleaning up the area. And the city was told, "You have no authority over permits for people to dump that in your aquifer." The city has no authority. Normally the city has authority to permit and review. So not only are there no permits, there's no review. There's no ability for the public to testify on this. That's how out of whack this system is today. So and, Mr. Mr. Diamond, so we've got the bill sure, on the juvenile sure. products. I think we're gonna have several bills on PFAS. Yeah. You're welcome to come back and focus on the water because we're going to have those discussions. Um, and I've got like 12 minutes left to get another bill through. So I'd, I'd invite you to come back on the water. Thank you, and Will. And my real point is this is coming at us from a number of different directions. So if you just look at it, as important it is to address it here, you also have to address it in those other areas. Thank you for the time. Thank you. Is there anyone else in the audience who would like to testify on the bill? Representative Katiza Watoon, any closing comments? Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, committee members, uh, for a brief conversation today. I know you have a lot of work to um, ahead of you um, in, in considering these proposals. Um, I know Representative Edelson had asked about um, if there was a safe, any, any safe limit of, of PFAS, and we um, uh, didn't get to the Pollution Control Agency, but I know that they're here, and potentially they can um, just answer that if they come up to testify on the next bill or sometime in the future. Maybe in the next but, bill. If they um, yep, that's totally fine with me. Um, I just, I, I appreciate the time. I appreciate uh, Representative Heinzman's um, consideration and, and kind of working together on this as we move forward. Like I said, kind of in, in anywhere in that manufacturing to retail chain, I think wherever we can make the biggest impact is where we want to um, put our focus. So I think, um, you know, we put our heads together and, and hopefully um, improve upon what some other states have done before us. Because, um, but I think that that's a great place to start. So, thank you so much. I renew my motion that House File 552 be recommended to be re-referred to the Commerce, Finance, and Policy Committee. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. Aye. All those opposed, no. Ayes have it. The motion prevails. Congratulations. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Next up, House File 372, Representative Hollins. Products containing PFAS notice required and rulemaking required. I will move that House File 372 be recommended to be re-referred to the Commerce, Finance, and Policy Committee. Representative Hollins, to your bill. Uh, good afternoon, Mr. Chair, and good afternoon, committee members. I will be very brief because I know we don't have that much time. Um, and you've heard a lot about PFAS today, so I don't need to go over the specifics of this. Um, but I will tell you a little bit about the overview of my bill. So um, the PFAS disclosure, information disclosure bill would require products with intentionally added PFAS that are sold, offered for sale, or distributed in Minnesota to submit notice to the MPCA commissioner no later than 30 days before initial sale, offer for sale, or distribution of the product. 
um, the commissioner may extend the deadline if they determine that it's appropriate. Um, if the information is publicly available elsewhere, um, such as a public website, then the commissioner may waive the disclosure requirement and the commissioner can enter into an agreement with one or more states um, a political subdivision of a state to create a shared system of notices. Uh, furthermore, if there's a grouping of particular items that somebody is creating and distributing, they can do just one disclosure for the whole group of those items. I would like to give time to my testifiers, so I'm sorry if I went really fast. <laughs> no problem. Uh, first up, Amara Strandi. Hi, Mr. Chair and members. Uh, my name is Amara Strandi, and um, I am, was diagnosed with fibrolamellar hepatocellular carcinoma when I was 15. And uh, 2020 was the year my cancer became unstoppable. Last spring, I learned that all four, all four tumors were moved in a December. 2021 surgery grew back, now worse than ever before. The tumor in the right arm brachial plexus grew back, wrapping around the upper right side of my chest, fracturing my first and third rib, with additional tumors growing next to my heart. The pain in my right hand is excruciating, and little can be done to subside it. They can't do surgery this time, there are no more treatments to try. I can no longer move the fingers on my right hand. I can no longer braid my hair or play the piano as I once could. We need stricter regulations on the use of PFAS chemicals. We also need more education for the public about the dangers of these chemicals so that people can make informed choices about the products they use. The health and well-being of our communities should be a top priority, and we must take action to protect ourselves and future generations from the devastating effects of PFAS. Through no fault of my own, it is quite possible that I was exposed to toxic chemicals dumped by 3M. But regardless of who's at fault, I never had the opportunity to make an educated purchase on products contaminated with PFAS to prevent a cancer diagnosis actively. We have all paid a high price due to large corporations carelessly dumping known toxic chemicals. However, we have yet to see public health repaid for the time, money, and emotional turmoil inflicted by these same chemicals. I've spent the last five years fighting cancer with every ounce of my being and I will for the rest of my life. Corporations must stop the production of these toxins and be held accountable for not disclosing this information. I urge all of you to take a stand against these toxic chemicals and demand that companies disclose information on products contaminated with PFAs. Nobody should ever come close to the pain I experienced living with fibrolamellar, especially if it is preventable, thanks to adequately disclosed regulated information. By requiring such disclosure, we can make a difference and protect ourselves and the future generations from the devastating effects of PFAS. That is all that I ask from you. Thank you. Michael Strandy. Chairman Hansen and members of the committee, again, my name is Michael Strandy, father of Amara. Since the dawn of the Industrial Revolution, businesses and multi billion dollar corporations have polluted our lands, our air, our waters. There's been a disturbing pattern of such companies making choices that have been done 
that, that have done great harm to the environment and have placed human lives at risk. Companies have shown time and time again the willingness to protect the health and well-being of workers and families only when there is public outcry and after legislation by the government forcing them to do so. The intentional disregard to do what is right reveals how morally bankrupt some business leaders and corporate executives can be. For many corporate boards, the decisions that affect the lives of others is based on what they can legally get away with. The standards of what they can or cannot do is determined only by the laws of the county, state, or country they do business in. I find it rare the company that surpasses government standards. Over the past hundred years, allowing companies and multi-billion dollar corporations to self-regulate standards that protect human lives have shown to be, in many cases, detrimental to the environment and deadly to people. How unfortunate it has been that so many corporations have placed profit over protecting the most vulnerable in our communities. With the introduction of deadly chemicals known as PFAS, companies have known how dangerous these chemicals are, yet they have chosen to keep the knowledge of the dangers of these chemicals away from people who purchase their products. Many companies have already shown that they will not volunteer to divulge the use of PFAS in their products unless they are forced by the government to do so. The people of Minnesota ought to have the choice to whether or not bring into their homes a product that is created with potentially deadly chemicals. Having products clearly labeled as containing such chemicals will allow consumers to make the best decisions for themselves. I urge you to support House File 372. And again, thank you for your time. Thank you. Members, what I'd like to do, we have just a few minutes and we will run a few minutes over. I wanna get the testifiers in. Um, what I'd like to do is just hold it over for the vote tomorrow morning or tomorrow when we have a uh, committee. Uh, if that's okay, uh, Representative Holland. Yep. And that, because I want to make sure we get all the testifiers in and we have sure. very little okay. time. Thank you. Uh, Ivana Stark, Clean Water Action. Mr. Chair, why we're waiting? I would like to go right, get the testifiers here because some of them have traveled. So. Mr. Chair, I just Ms. want to Stark. mention that we're going to have a caucus in a few minutes and so I'm not trying to be rude, but our members will be leaving. We are here to hear testimony from the public, not to go to caucus. Ms. Stark. Chair Hansen and members of the committee, I'm Ivana Stark, State Director of Clean Water Action. My previous two, the previous two bills lay out the need for House File 372. We know that PFAS are a threat to human health and taxpayer dollars. Consumers have the right to know what they're bringing into their homes. Families should be able to know about the products that enter their homes so they can choose to purchase them or not. I can't tell you for sure if these toys I've shared have PFAS despite evidence that they do because there's no label helping me to make an informed purchasing decision. This legislation will allow people to make informed decisions around the health and safety of their families. I've been asked why this legislation is needed when some companies like 3M have announced that they are voluntarily phasing out PFAS chemicals and it's simple. 3M is not bound by law to complete this goal much less within the timeline that they have set for themselves. Product bans will codify protections for Minnesota families. The bill will verify businesses that voluntarily stop using or manufacturing PFAS are being truthful to consumers with regard to truly honoring their pledge to end the use of PFAS chemicals. Finally, businesses can't tackle the problem of PFAS in Minnesota alone. We can support others by taking this step. I urge your support of House File 372. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Roxy has Kosicki, uh, Avida Med. The next will be Tony Quillis and then Carlos Gutierrez. Ms. Kosicki. You got that right, so thank you. <laughs> um, good afternoon, Chairman Hansen, Vice Chair Jordan, and members of the committee. Thank you for the opportunity to provide testimony on behalf of AdvaMed. My name is Roxy Kaczynski, and I'm the Director of State Government and Regional Affairs at, at the Advanced Medical Technology Association. AdvaMed represents nearly 450 of the world's leading innovators and manufacturers of medical devices, diagnostics, and digital health technologies. 
Minnesota is the second biggest med tech center nationwide in revenue, jobs, and payroll, generating an $8 billion industry and creating over 26,000 high paying jobs in this state. Medical devices made by AdvaMed members help patients stay healthier longer, expedite recovery, allow earlier detection of disease and improve effectiveness and efficiency of treatment. AdvaMed is here to testify today to express our concerns with House File 372. We want to work with the sponsor to ensure this bill makes Minnesota a leading steward of these complex compounds and to best safeguard uh, human health. PFAS are a broad class of over 12,000 chemistries providing unsubstitutable attributes of strength, durability, stability, resilience, and sterility required for the safe functioning of a broad range of products, including medical devices and technology. It is not scientifically accurate to regulate them as a single class due to this extremely broad nature. Narrowing this definition of PFAS to target, for example, water-soluble PFAS would address the most concerning category of these chemicals in the environment that negatively affect human health. As was mentioned before, the EPA's recent PFAS roadmap recognizes this broad class of PFAS and outlines additional efforts to define, subcategorize, assess, and regulate this important class of compounds. The administration and EPA agreed to a targeted approach to regulate by groupings of chemicals rather than regulate as one big class. Additional reporting requirements at the state level will lead to multiple testing requirements with multiple definitions of PFAS. So we urge the committee to avoid redundant use of state resources and support the EPA's effort to comprehensively identify PFAS substances and avoid a patchwork. We also support the use of existing databases as was mentioned by the sponsor. It is important for the committee to note that there is no commercially available technique that can assess for all 12,034 PFAS chemicals at one time. In addition, due to the complexity of the supply chain, which can be eight to 10 layers deep for complex medical technology, it can take years for information to propagate upstream and for suppliers to become aware of newly regulated substances. Medical device manufacturers are beholden to the information that their suppliers provide, which is unfortunately not always a consistent or standard readout of the materials in the product. Our industry is working on alternatives that could be an adequate substitute and could also be approved by the FDA. The human health risks and optimal product quality of these and thousands of other medical devices are thoroughly assessed by the FDA before they make it on the market. They must undergo multiple tests to prove biocompatibility in compliance with international standards and an assessment of who will be utilizing this device, the practitioner or the patient, as part of their approval process. In 2022, California passed a near identical bill that exempt medical devices, but it was ultimately vetoed by the governor due to high implementation costs and other complications. In 2021, Maine passed a far reaching law and ban, and they have yet to begin their rulemaking because of the complexity involved. Given all of this complexity, extensive supply chain involvement and rigorous regulatory framework that goes into the manufacturing and approval of life-saving FDA regulated medical devices and products, we respectfully request the committee to exempt medical devices and products from this bill the way California did last year. AdvaMed appreciates the opportunity to provide these comments and we look forward to working with the committee and the sponsor on this important matter going forward. Thank you. I'm going to go to Mr. Gutierrez because he has not addressed the committee before and then. Mr. Gutierrez, welcome. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and members. My name is Carlos Gutierrez. I'm the Vice President of State and Local Government Affairs for the Consumer, <clears throat> Consumer Healthcare Products Association in Washington, D.C. Um, I did submit written comments, so they're a little bit more uh, specific. I know we're short on time, so I'll be very brief with my comments. Um, we don't intentionally add PFAS to our products. However, that does depend on how you def define PFAS. And in this bill, uh, it says, <clears throat> 
any fluorinated carbon atom um, counts as a PFA. And that then implicates fluticasone, I think I said that right, which is the active ingredient in Flonase. So on one hand, you know, the FDA is saying it's safe and effective, but on another hand, this bill would, would suggest that it's a PFA. And our worry is that um, consumers will take that as that it's not safe and they won't treat their ailments as necessary. So um, like Advamed, we have asked for an exemption. Uh, we got it in California um, and ultimately it was vetoed. And there are several states considering this this year. I think all of that, that conversation has progressed very well and we would ask for that same treatment here as well. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Mr. Quillis, is there anyone else in the audience who would like to testify? Mr. Chairman, for the record again, Tony Quillis, I'm the Director of Environmental Policy uh, at the Minnesota Chamber of Commerce. I'd like to, another hallway conversation I had with Representative Hollins this morning um, because of schedules around this place. And I'm not gonna repeat, Mr. Chairman, what other folks have said in front of me, but. This class of chemicals is tough to regulate in a one size fits all. As you've heard, there's thousands of uses for it and probably over 9,000 products out right now. Some of the examples would include medical devices as you've heard right now, pacemakers, stents, hearing aids, uh, boats, motor vehicles, electric vehicles, solar panels, cell phones, kitchen appliances. So trying to figure out um, with the definitions right now in there how all of those would report, Mr. Chairman, and the, the wide scope are uh, concerning. Um, there's no um, de minimis standard for it. So as Mr. Gutierrez said, just um, any sort of uh, trace of it would trigger uh, a reporting requirement. Also, no exemptions for federally uh, regulated products. The other thing, Mr. Chairman, is uh, concerning is this would be a lot of data that would be submitted to the state right now, and there's no assurance of proprietary information or confidential business information um, being protected in there. So uh, it's a conversation I'd like to keep having with uh, Representative Hollins. And then you've heard about other things that are going on right now. The EPA is in the process, hopefully in the first half of its anticipated first quarter of this year, and even they are, um, scoping their uh, reporting requirements by NACS, the North American Industrial Classification System. Um, they're working on that. The Interstate Chemical Clearinghouse that Minnesota is a member of is trying to develop a statewide database so that everybody isn't um, competing and putting reporting at different states. So watching how that's moving along. And then you've heard about um, the state of Maine and how they're struggling right now to implement their um, reporting requirements with over 2,000 uh, companies ext uh, granted extensions, Mr. Chairman. So thank you very much. I really appreciate it. Look forward to working with Representative Hollins as this moves through the process to see if maybe we can, can scope it a little bit more and work in coordination with the federal government and other states. We will be laying this bill over for tomorrow. Uh, thank you, Representative Hollins. It is 4.37 p.m. We are adjourned.